Thank you, Dr. Rosetto. Moving straight in, moving straight into to Eric Martin. Um, Dr. Eric Martin is going to talk to us about the resilience for the Rocky Road, utilizing a resilience-based framework to support first-year student athletes. He is uh, the co-director of the Center for Physical Activity and Sport in the Department of Kinesiology. Uh, Eric received his doctoral training at Michigan State University. He has investigated various aspects of youth sport, including using sport to promote positive youth development, the factors that influence youth athlete motivation, and the outcomes of various types of motivation. He also explores resilience with particular attention to interventions aimed to influence both student athlete and college student resilience and coping skills. And in collaboration with several colleagues across the nation, he has also investigated athlete activism and the factors that influence athletes using their platform for social change. Take it away, Dr. Martin. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, let me get this. Okay, so as Matt said, we're kind of moving in and covering one of the projects that was done in collaboration with Illinois State University. Kelly was also a main collaborator on the project, and then Scott Pierce, who's there. And this project was actually funded by the NCAA Innovations and Research and Practice Grant. So I want to go give them a shout out for that. We know that first year students encounter a number of challenges. So we have things like a new time, um, things that they have to account for. They are getting more independence and more autonomy, and they really have their support networks that are going to be changed. And we know student athletes also experience unique challenges outside of what those are. So they're exposed to new elite athletic environments. Sometimes they're moving from being the best player on the team to now they're just one of many really good players. And that can be especially problematic if their athletic identity is too high and they really only see themselves as an athlete and that's now being threatened moving forward. So we wanted to kind of look in and try to increase their ability to demonstrate resilience in this transition. And we really believe that resilience is that process that's moving forward. And previous research has kind of shown us that those interventions that we're trying to create should try to do one of three things, if not all three. One of those is really optimize personal qualities. The second is try to create a facilitative environment for those individuals. And then the, the last one is really developing that challenge mindset. So they're able to see things in a more challenging way. With these ideas in mind, what we did is we designed a, a workshop program. And so this is our program content. On the left-hand side, you can see that stressors, and we all know students are going to experience stressors from a wide range of areas. And on that right-hand side, we're hopefully seeing more positive responses. They're going to lead to more optimal sport performance, but also we hope more academic performances as well. We see in this that we designed this four section workshop and it was delivered both as a live in person at Boise State University in an asynchronous online format to freshman student athletes at Illinois State University. And these workshops really focused on four things that we hoped would better prepare student athletes to demonstrate resilience in those, those times. So the first of those was really trying to get them to highlight, to create a more balanced student athlete identity. We know if they're unidimensional, if they only see themselves as an athlete, that's going to create lots of problems moving down the line. Second, we wanted to really develop their coping resources and strategies and help them kind of recognize the ones they're using that are helpful and maybe develop some new ones as they move forward. Third is we wanted them to identify the levels of social support they were currently getting, where there might be deficits, and then what resources were available for those individuals at the university of their choice. So at Boise State, what was available for them? At Illinois State, what was available for them? Lastly, we really wanted them to take an outward viewpoint of you know, some of these skills that they're developing and think about what does that mean for me as a leader? What can I do as a leader, either on my team or just in general as a leader moving forward? What we found going through this workshop, and again, it was a four workshop series, is that overall, there were very small differences between the student athlete perceptions who were in the online and the in-person program, which is helpful to know that really either way was offered, it was, it was somewhat beneficial. What we saw is that student athletes felt that all four workshops were highly beneficial to their transition to their university, which is what we were hoping for. And they also said that it was very beneficial for their development over the next four to five years at university. So not only are they seeing that benefit in that transition, but they're seeing that transfer the next four or five years going through university. Athletes also indicated they engaged in very specific actions because of the workshop. So they took steps to become a better well-rounded person. They use better coping strategies than they had in the past. 
they were better able to understand the social support available at their university, and they were better leaders because of the content that was really coming through. Student athletes also viewed the program very positively. In fact, 93% of student athletes recommended that student athletes take this program or a similar program if they were coming into a program. So we were pleased with some of those results. From that, we tried to think about what kind of implications we could have for campus level programming as a whole. First, we really need to identify and empower champions to drive resilience and psychological development programming because if we can educate coaches and support staff to really facilitate that resilience, that's going to be much more long lasting than just a four workshop series. We know resilience cannot be accomplished in a single program. We can start planting those seeds, but we need those, those key stakeholders to continuously move those forward. And so really getting them on board is critical for the success for students in that time and then over the long haul as well. Third, we wanted to promote activities and collaborative learning experiences in both the face-to-face -face and online programming. One of the athletes said it was really highlighting to just talk about the stress and the time management problems they were having with this transition because as a student athlete, they were seen as kind of invincible or they really couldn't voice those problems. And so just normalizing those concerns was something that was very powerful and happened in that collaborative environment. And then lastly, we really think it's important to tailor educational programming to that population. So we use Boise State examples when we were here, what were the resources specific available to them? And so not being more general, but giving them very, very specific things that they could actually do and work on moving forward. Um, we have some future directions that Kelly and I want to kind of explore as we move forward. One of those is to expand resilience programming to non-athletes. We know general student athletes or students are having some of those same issues. And so we want to expand those both to the undergrad and graduate students who are maybe entering into graduate school who may have some challenges associated with them or just coming into the university setting. We also wanna expand that programming to students who may be at risk for non-completion. This could be juniors who may have just a lack of social support at home or a lack of social support in their community and just have relevant challenges that are, that are there and really look at what they've accomplished the first two years and then help them move forward with the next year. Lastly, we really wanna focus on creating an environment that supports student resilience instead of just solely focusing on student skills. One of the things we try to do is expose students where they could get the support because we know resilience is a community-wide environmental aspect and we need to start thinking of it more as a community-wide thing instead of just an individual issue or an individual development moving forward. So um, I thank everybody for listening to a little bit about our program and I look forward to listening to everybody else's program. Thanks, Eric. Really important work and I'm happy you got such positive feedback already. Um, the next up is Dr. James Buscemin. He's gonna to talk to us about salutogenic strategies to enhance holistic wellness. I really look forward to learning what salutogenic means and if I even pronounced it right. So uh, uh, Dr. Buscemin is an assistant professor in the School of Social Work. James received his doctoral training at Ohio State University. Uh, his research interests include wellness promotion, integrated mind-body-spirit interventions, solution-focused brief therapy, and the mental health of college students. His current projects include the development of a web-based solution-focused wellness intervention for college students, as well as examining the effectiveness of an integrated mind-body-spirit interventions in the treatment of schizophrenia and post-traumatic stress disorder. Take it away, Dr. Buscemin. Okay, thanks, Mac. I'm assuming everybody can, can see my PowerPoint. Yes, fantastic. So I'm, I'm gonna be talking about wellness or more officially salutogenic strategies to enhance holistic wellness. Really, I just like the opportunity to use the word salutogenic. It's one of those pretentious academic terms that basically just means moving towards optimal wellness as opposed to away from illness, which, you know, quite honestly, is a very important distinction to make, particularly when it comes to wellness promotion. But anyway, I'll do my best to keep it brief. However, uh, I can imagine that being a challenge since it's so rare that I have a captive audience to listen to my research. <laughs> um, I can tell you that my wife and kids have heard enough about wellness to last a lifetime. Um, so, uh, a bit of background, I'm, I'm very interested in intervention research, and I have a particular interest in the wellness of college students, um, which can be a bit of a tough sell at times when it comes to things like funding, given that a lot of times I think college students are perceived as entitled and privileged, and 
which, you know, in many ways they may be, but in some other ways they can be a really at risk population, I think. So it's great to see that other professionals are, are focused on this population as well. Um, without getting too personal or in depth, a lot of this interest came from my own experience. Um, when I was a doc student at Ohio State, I was one of a very small cohort, seven total. And of those seven, two dropped out and one died from a stress related heart attack. So at that point, I was kind of like, okay, you know, something needs to change. Uh, and I think it, it's important to focus on prevention rather than waiting until the wheels fall off and, and, and then intervening. Because for me, wellness is really about prevention. Um, so on a lighter note, uh, as I mentioned, wellness promotion can, can have a lot to do with lifestyle and making some, some very minor adjustments that can lead to prevention. So while this image may seem a bit ridiculous, uh, I think it may not be all that far from reality. Um, I look around and I see all these hoverboards and electric scooters and I'm always thinking, wow, we don't even walk anymore. Um, and if I'm being totally honest, usually my second thought is, wow, I'd love to try that. Um, <laughs> Um, so what is wellness? You know, it's one of those fairly generic terms, um, that sort of turned into a term du jour, right? It, it's a great problem to have because you now wellness is everywhere. Um, but a nice simple definition that I like is a way of life oriented towards optimal health and well-being, in which mind, body, and spirit are integrated by the individual to live life more fully. Um, and for me, what makes wellness such an interesting construct is the multidimensional nature of it. You're not either well or not well, right? There's a bit more to it. Um, and there's many ways to conceptualize wellness. You know, in fact, here at Boise State, we have the, the eight dimensions of wellness. And there's many, many evidence-based models. I like to use a common factors approach. So, you know, in other words, if we were to boil down all of the evidence-based models out there, the vast majority of them would have these five domains, physical, social, intellectual, spiritual, and emotional wellness. So what does all of this mean to my research? Well, to start, I developed a, a six week group intervention based on an integration of this common factors approach to wellness with a solution focused coaching modality, uh, an approach that really aligns beautifully with this whole idea of salutogenesis. So really looking at moving towards optimal wellness, whatever that looks like for the individual across these different domains, um, the domains that individuals feel are most important to them. Um, so, you know, and I think that's part of what's, what's beautiful about wellness is that it can mean many different things to different people. So looking at ways to improve this can be very preventative. And so very briefly, what I found um, is that compared to treatment as usual, which in this particular study um, was a general inter interpersonal process support group, stress went down significantly and uh, perceived wellness improved significantly. Um, and then, um, you know, to follow that up, tested the, the lasting impact of the intervention. So, you know, did a, a six week follow up to see, does, do these changes stick? you know, and, and are people still practicing these wellness uh, interventions? So uh, there was some significant lasting impact as it related to wellness and stress, um, which, you know, all that to say that when it comes to college students and wellness, it appears that a, an ounce of prevention is, is maybe worth a pound of cure. Um, the combination of using the solution focused approach with a common factors model of wellness over a really brief period of time can help facilitate wellness related change and, and sort of establish buffers, if you will, to some of the stress. Um, so very quickly, you know, I, I've been able to expand upon this research to, to generalize to other populations, including women who have HIV uh, and have modified the intervention into a, a brief um, IPE intervention, um, which I did with the, the school of nursing. Uh, as well as an interactive web-based module focused on social wellness. Something I didn't include on this slide that I'm really excited and, and optimistic about is promoting wellness within an incarcerated population. So prior to COVID hitting, I had started some research with the Department of Corrections out at ISCI, and I'm really hopeful that you know, we'll be able to resume sooner than later. Currently, um, I've received a little bit of funding that's been allowed, you know, it's allowed me to 
to uh, continue to do this research and see if, you know, given the current state of affairs, we can't turn some lemons into lemonade. Um, so I'm, I'm running several six week wellness interventions for grad students using Zoom as a platform. Uh, so we'll be able to examine the effectiveness of this approach and if in fact, you know, we are in this reality for a while. Um, I'm also running the intervention specifically with participants in the Masters of Athletic Leadership program. So it'll be interesting to see how that works with a cohort model. And finally, how does all this relate to resilience? Well, there's certainly some data out there that connects resilience and positive wellness related effects like the quality of life and improvements in coping, uh, which Dr. Rizzo just highlighted a few minutes ago. Um, however, there's really pretty, pretty little, uh, pretty limited research linking resilience and wellness as a, as a multidimensional construct which intuitively makes sense, you know, that the more well we are, the more resilient we would be. But I'd like to make some more direct connections there, specifically with college students. Um, and we know that resilience is important in predicting academic persistence and mental health. So it seems like a pretty natural fit um, if any of you resiliency researchers are open to collaborating. Anyway, clearly I love to chat about this stuff. Um, so anyone who has questions or an interest, please feel free to reach out and Appreciate you listening. Perfect. Thanks, James. Appreciate that. Thank um, you. Yeah, the next, the next um, presenter is Dr. Catherine Demps. She's going to talk to us about behavioral endocrinology, perception and pathways from the external to the internal. Uh, Dr. Demps is an associate professor uh, and human behavioral ecologist in the Department of Anthropology. Catherine received her doctoral training at the University of California, Davis where she specialized in the study of the evolution of beha human behavior, focusing on human behavioral ecology. Catherine's currently studies uh, human behavior from multiple state, uh, types of explanations, including the drivers of recreation on public lands and relationships with wildlife, the endocrinology of social relationships and the origins of market exchange. Take it away, Dr. Demps. Catherine, you're muted. Hello. Hello. <laughs> so I put in my bio that I'm a human behavioral ecologist because I'm really interested in how human behavior responds to ecological contexts. And I'm primarily interested in evolutionary explanations for variation in behavior, behavioral responses. But one thing that people in my field neglect um, systematically is mechanisms, ways that how, like, how does environment translate to behavior? We just have to assume that it does. Um, and that's how I became a behavioral endocrinologist because I've started matching up um, aspects of the environment to internal physiological factors, um, primarily using the hormones cortisol and testosterone as these biomarkers to see how extrasomatic environments are translated into these internal responses. So I've also become a bit of a evolutionary anthropologist of medicine, um, studying how human well-being is tied to environments. Um, so when I ask a question like, how do we expect humans to invite it to uh, exploit environments for leisure, it leads me to these much more specific questions like, does going for a hike make you feel less stressed? Okay, and you imagine the short answer is yes, of course, I go for a hike and I feel less stressed. And, and once we delved into the literature, it was quite surprising to me that all of the data was self-report and none of it was physiological. And so that's one of the things that our lab did is actually go out and collect this physiological data to see how does something like a hike um, correlate with levels of cortisol, which is a rough marker of stress. And, you know, you do things like hand out GPS devices and cameras and surveys. And so you get this, as um, James was saying, this well-rounded picture of what are people experiencing? What are they perceiving? And how does that directly translate to physiological stress? And we can use all these mixed methods together to create this more well-rounded understanding. Um, Okay, so I told you some of this evolutionary social scientists, they tend to neglect the mechanism on purpose because they're hard to study, but with some of these new analysis techniques like um, ELISA methods that allow you to um, easily collect saliva that has um, reliable measures of circulating levels of cortisol and testosterone, it's actually quite a simple method now and it's only 
you know, it's fairly cheap as, as far as biological research goes. And so um, I really like to tout this as a great example of team science because I haven't done any of these projects on my own. They've all been with folks in um, other folks in anthropology like Kristen, you'll hear from later. Um, psychology, uh, you'll hear from April later and biology. So uh, this started out with the benevolence of Julie Heath in biology who studies stress in birds and she kind of helped us get trained on the, the methods. So here's one of our hikers putting um, spit into our little vial that we'll then take back to the lab and extract cortisol from. Um, as interesting as, uh, as the results from these projects have been, for um, Boise State and we've gotten some local media attention as well. We've actually had a, a fairly difficult time finding the right venue for academic publication because it's so interdisciplinary that um, it's really hard to find an editor of an academic journal who feels qualified to review both endocrinological data and things like peer oriented guided inquiry learning strategies. Um, so it, it has been, um, insightful to how siloed academia remains. Um, and I should say that this is really a method, as I said, um, as a method, it's at the nexus of social and biological science and environmental science. Um, so it leads, it allows us to ask all of these interesting interdisciplinary questions, but it is just a method that anyone could, could pick up. So this is um, our very first project. It started with this little tiny grant from the CTL that helped us get trained and collect our first data and say something interesting about learning. And we were exploring how students responded to learning and testing environments. So you can see here on the left, um, we have salivary cortisol levels and we have five different um, uh, collections, one at baseline. And there are a few things you have to know about cortisol to do the collection. Like you don't wanna collect it too early in the morning collect it within people, same time every day. Um, I can talk to folks more if they're interested. So we have a baseline, a small group learning activity like a POGL peer-oriented peer guided inquiry learning, a traditional lecture, a multiple choice exam, and an essay exam. And um, you can see there's not a ton of variation. We did find overall the small group activity had the lowest levels of cortisol for students. So they, they found that less stressful. Um, the only one that significantly differed from baseline and the other interesting thing here is that the variation is the smallest for this category too. Now you'll notice that the first author on this paper is in fact Kristen that you'll hear from later, even though she probably won't talk about this stuff today. Um, individually, um, Yes, the, and the other thing I wanted to tell you about, oh, overall the learning activities were less stressful for the than the exam activities, but you can see how much overlap there is between here. And the other very interesting thing that I found that other stress researchers might also find interesting is that when you ask individuals how stressed they are for their self-report, and so these are the categories of self-report from less stressed to most stressed, and you compare those to measures of salivary cortisol, there is in fact no relationship between reported levels of stress and physiological measures of stress. I have searched and searched through the academic uh, literature and I have not found this result anywhere else. Um, it might just be buried in some papers like it is buried in this paper. Uh, it's not in the title, so it doesn't pop up on Google Scholar easily. But I just found that as, as a really um, eye-opening uh, finding that self-reports, um, they, they are certainly informative, but maybe there's something, there's, there's obviously a disconnect between self-report and physiological, um, I can't see the, the chat right now. Okay, and physiological responses. Okay, so um, kind of the same thing happened. We did another um, experiment. This is the stress, the hikers and stress experiment that I did. Here's Ellie Opdahl. She was the master's student who did the um, lion's share of the data collection. And this was her for her master's thesis. And so she was answering the question, you know, does going for a hike make you less stressed? And she handed out all these different types of data collection strategies. And if you're interested, here are the links to the um, news media coverage of the project. Um, and so what we did is we used like, we use these pictures, we use the GPS tracks, here's where people went in the Camels Back to Ridge to Rivers area, and here's where they took all of their photos. Um, and she used this Landsat data to see like, well, is it hiking near trees? Is it getting a great view? You know, is it the length of your hike? What is causing um, decreases in stress? And uh, here's the results. So I'm going to tell you about this one first. So here's change in cortisol, okay? So the more riparian area that you hiked through, the greater the decrease in cortisol. 
So yes, overall going for a hike decreases cortisol, um, decreases stress, um, but the more trees and water you walk near, the greater that effect. The very interesting counterpoint to that is um, it all depends on how you perceive it. So we also ask people, you know, how, how beautiful did you find your hike today? And um, here is uh, very beautiful on the left. Um, and this is a PC, PC1 score. So it's a variety of components. We asked a bunch of questions and we, we put it into this one score. Um, and this is like terrible, all the cheat grass drives me crazy. I saw trash, you know, it's, it's, it was ugly. And people had an increase in cortisol if they perceived that it was a not, not an aesthetic hike. So it's that very important um, perception component as well. Okay. So we're still trying to get that published four years later because like I said, it's just been really hard to find the right editor to publish this stuff as fascinating as I personally think it is. And of course there's some other upcoming projects as well, um, taking this method and tying it to other disciplines. You'll hear from um, April and Kristen um, on how refugee students buffer stress with family relationships. So we're doing more of this cortisol analysis with um, behavioral interactions between refugee high school adolescents and their families. And um, a kind of a pet project of mine that I just love talking about is if you compare human social grooming to other primates, there's really no physiological data. Other primates, you know, the monkeys like pick the bugs out of each other's fur and they're just like basically fall asleep. It's so relaxing, but no one's ever tested this in humans. And so for me as an evolutionary anthropologist, I'm very fascinated to see how are we different as a species in terms of touching each other and the physiological response there as well. But like I said, this is really just the method at the crux of many disciplines and um, it's led to some interesting findings so far. Okay, thanks. That was very interesting stuff. I can't wait to read more about that. Thank you, Catherine. Um, next up, we have Saleh Ahmed. He is going to talk to us about mapping the resilience landscape among the marginalized populations, insights from the global south. Dr. Ahmed is an assistant professor in the School of Public Service. Saleh received his doctoral training at the University of Arizona. Utilizing a systems approach, he studies climate risk management and resilience planning, land use change and growth management, and the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Informed by political ecology, critical development studies, and cultural anthropology, Slay is advancing critical understanding on vulnerability, adaptation, and resilience, and their relevance to United Nations goals. Please take it away, Dr. Ahmed. Hi, thank you very much, Matt. Can you see my slides? Good, good. Thank you. Uh, it's just like, be like the bamboo bend but do not break. I'm talking about that is one of the resilience definitions. So like it's the ability to recover from or adjust easily with any source of stresses. Isn't it something like uh, we are now facing like with the COVID-19 pandemic. So how to cope with those stresses. So the concept of resilience are uh, one of the key issues that uh, could be critical in our contemporary time and even in the future uh, stresses like climate change impact or something like that. Today, in my presentation, I will actually talk about this resilience aspect among the marginalized populations from the global south, uh, and more particularly in coastal Bangladesh, where I spend most of my works and even my most of my life uh, since I, I'm originally from there. What I experienced uh, just working in coastal Bangladesh and also during my works in international development with some international agencies in other parts of uh, Asia and Africa, like uh, there's a, a, a major change of growing seasons and crop yields. So when it's about like growing seasons and crop yields, it actually affects people's, li people's livelihoods, reduce food security, increase poverty, but when we take uh, that to our uh, like own personal level, it's all about human sufferings, loss of property and assets. And the forced migration is not a futuristic thing. It's present in some societies. Uh, we have seen social and political unrest and conflicts. So for my own work, I always actually ask these four questions, like what do local people want to make their lives better? Are we, like the scholars or scientists or professionals are helping them to achieve those goals? If not, what should we do differently? How can we work together to make the positive change? 
It's not just like dumping the information or knowledge on the local people, how we can co-create the knowledge that can be relevant in the local context. Those were actually kind of like more, uh, my mo major inspiring uh, things and questions that I use in most of my works. So one of my recent works uh, was about like, how does the unequal power relations determine social vulnerability and resilience capacity? So what does that mean? Like in our society, like many factors like race, gender, ethnicity, age, religion, in income groups can actually affect how we can actually access to power or opportunities. If it's actually about power or opportunities that can be critical for uh, like vulnerability that can shape our vulnerability, that can shape our resilience capacity. So my key findings in my, uh, some of my recent works, like social vulnerability and resilience are the outcomes of unequal power structures because of gender, ethnicity, religion, and income differences in traditional agrarian society. So what I also actually found during my work, like there is a tendency to overlook these aspects, these aspects of social, economic, cultural, and political factors. Like when we think or design about some adaptive resources, when we make available to the people, or when we think for the resilience, we often actually overlook these dimensions. When we provide weather information or early warning to the people, we think everyone can actually have access to those. But what if in some agrarian context in the global South, what if they do not have, for example, cell phone? What if like ethnic minorities who might speak different language, not the language from the mainstream population? What if the smallholder farmers want to purchase a cell phone, but they do not have the resources to purchase a cell phone or something like that? So all these factors can actually influence or shape uh, their access to adaptive resources and could be critical for their resilience. So my success. So, so far, my success factors are kind of like, I'm trying to advance the, the aspects of resilience by incorporating the concept of inequality, social justice, and inclusive development. Inclusivity is actually core of my all arguments. I'm trying to form new collaborations with students, scholars, and practitioners uh, across geographics and including the local community peoples who are uh, directly affected by various aspects of the uh, problems. Challenges, of course, easily I can blame to the ongoing pandemic, like it has changed many of our works. So my field research was canceled in this summer, most likely that might affect my next summer work. But these challenges also actually provided me some opportunities. Like, you know, like, uh, I'm actually presenting how, what resilience means, but how we are coping with uh, this pandemic time, how we are moving forward, it's all about resilience, even in the personal level. But also like this pandemic or this challenge also helped me to promote or to provide some more evidence, like how and why uh, like social justice or inclusive development are critical. So the, to some extent, these challenges are also kind of like uh, acting as my opportunities uh, or providing more evidence to my arguments. Future questions, definitely. I have more in, uh, questions than these three, but these particular three things could be very relevant to the resilience aspect. Like I'm trying to understand how the changing patterns of weather and climate are expanding our existing social, economic, and political inequalities. Inequality exists in different societies, in different formats, and climate and weather stresses we are getting more exposed to. So are these climatic stresses will expand those inequalities? Then we all are talking about resilience thinking, resilience concept, applications of resilience. But what are the theoretical and empirical uh, limitations of contemporary resilience uh, thinking? And what will a better understanding of the concept and application of resilience will help us to reduce our existing uh, like inequalities. And of course, like achieving uh, national and global development goals, such as United Nations development goals, sustainable development goals, what we promised all nations of this planet promised to achieve by 2030. 
So technically, I'm trying to identify and understand the nexus between inequality, resilience, and development goals like United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. In that note, I will actually stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. Such important and really inspiring work. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, next up, we have Kristen Snopkowski. She's going to talk to us about evolutionary perspectives on suicidal thoughts and behaviors. Um, she's an associate professor, Department of Anthropology. Kristen received her doctoral training at the University of New Mexico as an evolutionary anthropologist and human behavioral ecologist. Her research focuses on the ways that evolutionary and e ecological forces shape modern human variation with a particular focus on reproductive decision-making, intergenerational and sexual cooperation and conflict, mental health, menopause, and hormonal correlates. Please take it away, Dr. Stopkowski. All right, thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna jump right into it here. So six minutes is so quick. So um, based on the most recent estimates that are available, almost 50,000 people um, die each year in the United States by suicide. So it's the 10th leading cause of death among adults and the second leading cause of death for young adults, people aged 15 to 34 in our country. This figure here that you can see on the screen um, shows you the suicide rates for the two 10-year timeframes um, up to 2018 is the most recent data that's available. Just to point out, um, the, the gray um, areas, those are counties that have missing data. So those are counties that have fewer than 10 suicides over the 10 years that this is looking at. Um, but what you can really see here as you compare across um, 1999 to 2008 in comparison to 2009 to 2018 is that suicide rates are, are increasing um, across the United States, particularly in the West. And we can see kind of a stripe almost, if you will, on the East side as well. So I'm an evolutionary anthropologist. I'm going to argue that evolutionary perspectives may help us understand suicidal behavior. Obviously, mental health is very, very important. It's an important piece of suicidal behavior. I'm not going to focus on it here. Um, mostly because I'm really interested in ecological impacts. So how does our environment influence things? Um, from an evolutionary perspective, suicide seems pretty maladaptive. There are not really any cases where death by intentional self-harm sort of increases your own success. Um, but there are some theoretical cases where it has been predicted from an evolutionary um, perspective, including sacrificing oneself for your family or signaling need to those um, that, that are close to you. My research really focuses, um, as Matt introduced, on the role of kin cooperation and conflict. And perhaps this perspective can really help us understand suicide. We are obviously a very social species. We always lived in groups. Our success as individuals depends on our success living with others. Um, we have a need to feel connected to others. We um, need to feel that we are a member of a group and we can contribute to the well-being of others. And obviously you don't need to be an evolutionary scientist to, to recognize these, these are pretty well known, um, but they map on quite well to suicide risk. Those who have social support, have positive relationships with their families, are well integrated into their communities, have the resilience to overcome the challenging life situations that may, um, for people who don't have that kind of support, lead to suicidal ideation and or uh, suicide risk. Research, for instance, has shown that um, men who are divorced, who have recently experienced a breakup, are at higher risk of suicide. Um, there was a study in China that looked at older men who never married and they have higher depression and suicidal ideation. Um, we also have socioeconomic factors such as like bankruptcy and job loss are associated with increased suicide risk. So social support is really important. And I recently had a paper um, come out with my co-author, John Zyker, who's the chair of the anthropology department where we examine suicidal ideation among uh, Canadian adolescents in a longitudinal sample. And not surprisingly, the most important predictors included social support of both the adolescent and of their parents. And that was over um, their childhood. This, the second most important predictor was whether or not the adolescent had experienced stressful events in childhood. Again, neither of those are particularly surprising results, but you reinforce some of the things we might have predicted. 
Another project that I'm working on is actually examining the role of sex ratio on suicide. And so sex ratio is the number of males to females in a, in a population. And obviously this has some issues with conceptualizing gender or sex as binary, um, but the CDC collects this, this data and reports on it. Um, here's actually a chart of sex ratio across the United States, excluding prison populations. Um, sex ratio has been associated with a variety of different behaviors, such as marriage, marriage stability, violence, rates of STDs, um, divorce rate, lots of different factors. And so why might this matter? Um, so if we imagine heterosexual mating markets, which again, excludes people who are not uh, heterosexual, but if we think about those mating markets, um, whichever gender is less frequent, let's say that there's um, more men than there are women in a population, then women may have greater bargaining power to choose partners that, um, sorry, choose partners um, that fit their particular preference. So in these sorts of situations, we tend to see that marriages are more stable, divorce is less frequent. In contrast, when you actually have um, more women and fewer men in a population, you actually see higher rates of uh, divorce and less stable marriages. So one of my students decided, um, one of my students and I decided to take a look at this in correlation to suicide. And so um, there's lots of factors that influence suicide. So all of our analyses controlled for unemployment rates, percent of veterans, ethnic background in the, in the county, median household income, population density, um, and so we can see here some charts of sex ratio by U.S. county, in addition to um, the male suicide rate by county and female suicide rate by county. And this is over 20 years and the, most, the 20 most recent years of data. Um, we can see that females have a lot of missing data. And so those are just counties where there's fewer than 10 suicides by, by women across those 20 years. And so the results show that sort of as expected, male suicide at older ages were higher in male bias counties. Surprisingly, I was very surprised by this, male suicide at younger ages, so 15 to 34, was actually lower in male bias counties. And I'm really excited to explore this a little bit more. It may be related to camaraderie or something like that. The effects for women are, are much weaker and there seems to be less going on there. Moving on to potential future studies, um, we all live in, in Idaho. Here we have uh, suicide rates in Idaho. They have also been increasing. Uh, we see that the rural urban gradient is increasing. So um, here this chart on the bottom is actually looking at the more the most urban county or the most urban areas of our country to the most rural urban most rural areas of um, of the US. And we can see here that rural areas are actually increasing at a faster rate than, than urban ones. And so I uh, just submitted a grant last week with my collaborator, Dr. Cheryl Anderson, to examine whether social support and socioeconomic factors interact with rural urban status to influence suicide risk. So uh, that was really, really fast, but um, thanks to my collaborators, want to make sure I reference them and thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kristen. I'll be pinging you for more information on that for sure. Uh, the next and last uh, presenter we have is Dr. April Masaryk. She's going to talk to, about, talk to us about, it's all about community and resilience research. Um, April is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychological Science. She received her doctoral training at University of California, Davis. Her research centers on stress and resilience, dynamics in close relationships, intergenerational transmission, and the social, cultural, and biological influences on development. Dr. Masaryk directs the Human Development and Ecology Lab, conducting research with an interdisciplinary team of faculty, students, and community stakeholders to investigate the factors that influence health and well being among refugee youth and families. Take it away, Dr. Masaryk. Thank you, Matt, and thanks for sticking with, uh, with me toward the final minutes of our time together. And you all can see my screen. Thumbs up, all right, thank you. So I don't need to convince all of you that community is important to us um, as scholars um, in our professional life, as well as just human beings trying to survive and thrive in our environments. And I pulled this quote uh, by our president, Dr. Marlene Trump, where she, she says it perfectly. It really takes a community um, working together to create innovation. Um, this is when 
ideas are born. Um, and this is when we're able to translate those innovative ideas into action. And so what I'd like to talk about today is a little bit of how I have turned my attention to um, understanding the role of community when it comes to uh, predicting and um, understanding resilience. But before that, of course, it's always good to, to operationalize the, the construct or the concept of resilience. I really like Anne Mastin's conceptualization. She thinks of resilience as the capacity of a dynamic system. So it's not just specific necessarily to an individual human. It can be um, a community itself. It can be um, societies at large. It can be a family. It can be a romantic couple, for example. And uh, who I am is, is really, um, I, I study how people change over time. I'm a developmental scientist. I, uh, as we grow and change across our life course, we inevitably encounter uh, the stressors of life. Um, to date, I've primarily studied economic stress or uh, what I call economic pressures um, and hostile or harsh family environments. I like to take a balanced approach like many of you do as well where you know, in order to study resilience, we're often studying the stressors or the stress or the negative things that kind of uh, interact with or combat um, or threaten right, our ability to adapt. I really like to take this balanced approach, um, particularly in the population that I'm working with right now, um, because a lot of the research to date utilizes a deficit model of well-being and development. In other words, we're focusing a lot on trauma and distress and negative child and adolescent outcomes. And it's good to think of the other side of the coin, which is much more positive, right? But also um, rich for um, new understandings about the human condition. Most of my work has employed multi-method longitudinal research designs. And I've worked with uh, white rural families from Iowa, uh, Mexican American families who live in California and mother child pairs from Pittsburgh um, who are um, ethnically diverse. But essentially I study individuals and they're nested in these communities, right? The family community, the school community, and then the community at large, however you want to um, conceptualize that. However, I haven't really, um, it, it wasn't really until I got to Boise State that I started thinking about resilience at the community level. And I'd like to just mention that community and resilience research is needed. And we can be thinking about this in at least two different ways. Community uh, resilience can be a variable of interest. Often when we talk about resilience, uh, if we look at the literature, it's like, okay, who are the gritty individuals or um, who are the people who can pull themselves up when the going gets tough? And uh, that research is great and valuable, of course, but it, it puts a lot of the emphasis on the individual and a lot of researchers and scholars um, are arguing that we need to move away from, from understanding resilience at the individual level, or at least incorporate resilience in levels outside of the individual, including the school environment and the community at large. Also in uh, many groups, particularly outside of weird uh, samples, when, when I say weird, I mean Western educated, um, from industrialized, rich democratic societies is, is that community or the collective is really everything and, and folks draw on their community um, to, to demonstrate resilience, to adapt um, when the going gets tough. There are some issues, of course, because resilience at the community level is less well investigated from an empirical standpoint. So there are some issues uh, with measurement and data collection, of course, we can think of, you know, sense of belonging to community as being an important variable to, to measure. Um, talking with community members, the, the degree to which the neighborhood or neighbors in the, in the neighborhood are cohesive. 
and so forth. You can see down here in the notes. And the way I measure it or tend to measure it is through um, asking folks about it, either in a survey or in a, a semi-structured interview. But on the other side of this is the idea that the community is a process and an outcome of the research itself. So in my research uh, here at Boise State, I collaborate with a lot of people. Um, some of them are here today, Kristen and Katie. I've even worked with Kelly and um, I've, I've loved getting to learn more about all of your research. I've also um, had the privilege and honor of working with members in the community, um, in the refugee community, as well as service providers that provide the services to the community. And um, of course, you know, the, the interdisciplinary research among scholars of, is, is, is the process, right? But then it also becomes a, a rich outcome. So we get to develop and um, foster, cultivate a sense of community among us as researchers, which is what you know, I believe this setting is intended to do. I'm getting a notice that my six minutes has elapsed. So I'm just going to very briefly mention that we've got a, a project going on that has been paused for the moment due to the pandemic um, with our collaborators pictured here. It's all about mapping stressors and sources of resilience among African refugees who are resettling in the Boise area. We're particularly interested in learning more about adolescents Edu educational outcomes. We've been featured in the news. I provided a couple of links here and we got all of this momentum and we got all of the funding and then the pandemic happened. And so we're actually exercising our own um, individual and team resilience here. The lessons and opportunities um, are vast and um, I've listed a couple of here. You have to develop trust and buy-in from the community. Um, and you've got to get the community, the refugee community, the refugee community in particular, to to help you do the work and to get excited about the work and getting their input and their experiences um, to inform the actual research design and the implementation of it, as well as the um, articulation of findings or the sharing of findings. So we've really got to rely on each other to um, spread the love and the knowledge. I don't speak the language. I don't share the ethnic or regional background of a uh, sample of interest. And so it's also very important to be aware of uh, positionality. So many opportunities working with wonderful, bright, dedicated students and um, getting involved on campus with student-led organizations like the Multilingual Student Alliance. Um, training uh, research assistants in Kristen and Katie's um, lab, going to conferences. It's, it's been, um, a, a, I would say it's been a, a, an exercise in patience and has brought a lot of joy at a personal and professional level. Uh, really quickly, future directions. Uh, we've got to continue to build community um, as researchers, as well as um, with the community at large. We've got to get creative. Uh, we got a one year no cost extension from the Spencer Foundation, but I'm, uh, I'm thinking we might need a little bit more time to do that, um, to, to actually go into people's homes, which is what we were doing to collect our data, going into people's homes and asking them questions, collecting saliva analyzing cortisol, videotaping them, interacting with each other. So there's also an opportunity for us to understand how the, the pandemic has uh, further um, influenced, these, influenced these families in terms of their already existing resettlement stressors, as well as the supports and the strengths that they're relying on to uh, weather the storm, so to speak. So thanks so much for your time. Thanks for sticking it out with me. Uh, apologies for running a little bit over and thanks to, to my colleagues and students and especially to the families that have welcomed, welcomed us into their home and allowed us to learn from them.